Uh, my name is Anthony Telford. I am the, the chief docent with the, the community of Jogatory. And we're really excited to have Tim Pinkney with us here today, our NASA ambassador. Uh, Tim Pinkney is, is uh, at the age of 13, he saw his first rocket launch, and he was hooked on space. And he set the goal to become an astronaut. That dream may be fulfilled in a couple uh, of years when he plans to be launched from the Virgin Galactic Spaceship 3. As it rockets into space and he experiences six minutes of weightlessness and simultaneously earns his FAA astronaut wings. Occupying his time until the launch, Tim has been his NASA Solar Ambassador since 2016, giving about 50 presentations per year to community and civic groups. He is the former Aerospace Museum of California's Interim Deputy Director in 2017 and 18, after being on their board of directors for 10 years. So a few interesting facts about Tim is he is a, a war veteran, Navy pilot, made the last aircraft carrier landing in the Vietnam War. So thank you for your service, Tim. We really appreciate that. Flew a e Flew a B-25 World War II bomber over the Golden Gate Bridge. He's known for keeping an engineless glider aloft for six hours. I have no idea how that's possible. <laughs> He's a former collegiate, rest, collegiate wrestler, pole vaulter, and mountain climber. And he grew an 842-pound pumpkin. <laughs> <laughs> and he showed me the picture. It's big. Really big. And that's, and that's not just a one-time thing. And you showed us a picture of about 2,000 pounds of pumpkins in one place, so it's good at it. Like a true Californian, he's a server. So without further ado, I'd like to turn the time over to Tim. Thank you, Anthony. I'm glad that you're all here and are going to face the weather that sadly shut down the observatory tonight. I was really looking forward to that. But, um, you know, the famous astronomer, philosopher, and author, Carl Sagan, said telescopes are like time machines. And we're about to launch the most complex, most sophisticated, most expensive uh, time machine that a man has ever built. And that's the James E. Webb Telescope. You know, the uh, solar system, sorry, the universe is about 13.8 uh, years. 13.8 billion years old, and this telescope, near as we can tell, will get us within 200 million years of the Big Bang. Now, 200 million years kind of sounds like a lot of time, but if you go back in Earth's history, 200 million years, where do you get the sweet spot of the dinosaurs? That was the golden age dinosaurs 200 million years ago. So, reality, that's not very long in cosmological terms. So, we're going to revolutionize what we know, and we're going to find out questions we didn't even know to ask. It's just going to be such a change in how we look at ourselves, the world, our solar system, exoplanets that we can see um, now a little bit, but now we'll be able to see much more, the more sophisticated uh, collection devices, let's call it that. I am the Solar System Ambassador. We are NASA volunteers. There's over a thousand of us, and we love what we're doing, and we love sharing our information. And NASA just loads and loads and loads of information about every project. And so they give us about one seminar a week, PowerPoint slides and everything else with an expert coming in and talking about it. So I'm just a sponge picking that up and then I take those slides and put them together with the slides I make to show you what's going to happen here. So we'll be looking at the universe, a Hubble picture. Has anybody all those who've seen a Hubble image, raise your hand. And, and, oh, okay. That, that's a 
teacher stare, isn't it? Yeah, you better raise your hands. You're over 10 years old, you better have seen one, right? Okay, well, impressive. Anthony talked about the pillars of creation. And that was a phenomenal image. I'm going to show you that image in infrared because that's what James Webb looks at. It will not be looking at visual, just a small sliver, visual light as compared to um, public is visual, web is infrared. It's only taken 20 some years. But tonight the talk is going to be a little bit about the man, then the mission, and then the machine. But before there was Hubble, I blew it. Before there was Webb, there was Hubble. And he was an astronomer that discovered some things that were pretty earth-shaking, which is why we named the telescope after him. Uh, in addition to classifying galaxies, he figured out that there was more than one galaxy in the universe, more than the Milky Way. It's kind of astounding to me that no one knew that. I mean, that that's just remarkable. It's much like Galileo in 1610, when he created an improved telescope, looked at Jupiter and saw four moons around it. And he tracked those for a week and saw that those moons were actually spinning around Jupiter. And he said, if moons spin around Jupiter, then we must be spinning around Earth. Because at the time, the church said, Earth is the center and the sun revolves around us. And uh, Galileo went to prison, had, had trouble with the church because of that particular concept. But he was right. Pioneers hit arrows in their backside sometimes. Uh, the other thing is the last point, which is the whole purpose of Wham, and that is to redshift. And that's how you can tell the universe is expanding. So here is all weight, all uh, light is energy. It's just in different forms and different powers. And so we see the visual, that's what you and I experience right now that we're looking at. And that's what Hubble does, a little bit of infrared, a little bit of ultraviolet, but primarily visual. And you've all seen light come through a prism. Have you guys seen light come through a prism and split out into a... No? Okay. Get a prism and you'll find this out. And um, at the top is infrared. But you've seen, you've seen the results of what water and light can do. Can you, have you ever seen a rainbow? There you are. You've seen light be split apart by atoms of water. And so that's what is the visual component. And as you notice here, the red have the longest wavelength, the grid is spread out. And so that's one of the reasons we have orange sunsets. If you saw that one tonight, that was glorious. I mentioned that if you're on Mars, you have red sky during the day, but at night you have blue sunsets in Mars because of the atmosphere of the ship of the different colors. So the long red wavelength is significant to, to web. Way back in the 1800s, it was discovered that visible light also had, there was another component beyond visible light, and that is infrared light. And you and I know infrared now because we use it every day. If you click on your TV, you can't see, you aim it, but you don't see the light, but it's there. Here's the full spectrum. On the very, very powerful side, on the left side, are the x-rays. We've all had those at some point in our medical history. And uh, they can see right through us and see through our bones and leave images. On the less powerful side, we have infrared microwaves and radio waves. We've, NASA has sent out different spacecraft to Hubble, we're 
looking at observable light primarily. Chandra was uh, still around doing x-rays, and Spitzer just uh, shut down after 15 plus years of giving us some phenomenal infrared uh, photos. This is kind of the history of up here, 1990, we've just got ground-based observatory. Now, 1990 sounds just not that long ago, but it was 30 years ago. And so, Hubble Deep Field was, you all know the story of Hubble Deep Field, that someone said, let's just point out a place that's dark, but we don't think any, any galaxies or anything ever exists out that way. And they pointed Hubble for 200 hours at one point it was done around the Earth. And what they got was essentially this picture that you're looking at here of seeing thousands of galaxies that we did not even know existed because no one had taken had powerful enough lens to receive the light, but a 200-hour exposure to do that. Then uh, we got a little bit more through the different missions that went on to Hubble. We upgraded our capabilities, and we got a deep field, which went even deeper. And then we added an infrared, so we could see even further back. And so we've just been expanding, as you can see here. What we're looking at is the Big Bang, here's present. And then we go back to that 200 million years after the Big Bang. And what's significant to notice here is this redshift. Um, redshift of one, and then it goes progressively to greater than 20. And I'll uh, demonstrate that in a second. But what we have now is we've gone as far as we can go with the futures here and now with Webb. Webb has a gigantic mirror seven times bigger than Hubble, and therefore it collect seven times more light, therefore it can see further back. But it has instruments that are a hundred times more powerful than Hubble. And so wet is just going to be so sensitive to be able to see so far that we're back to, I think, just 200 million years after the Big Bang. Now, visible light, we're all familiar with that, but infrared, if you haven't seen it, looks like that. Or if you're uh, a human being and you put a bag over your hand and you take a picture with infrared, you can see right through the bag. And if you were at the Aerospace Museum of California, which is out of McClellan, during the Hubble exhibit that they had there for a year and a half, they had that demonstration. That was all before COVID, and you couldn't put your hand same hand, your hand and my hand couldn't go into the same black bag. So that had to stop. But here's an optical camera you've all seen in your, your hot stove, but an infrared camera will show a whole lot more heat. And that's the whole thing about web. It's different. Gamma rays, powerful ones, radio waves, you can see how they're tiny here, and then get bigger and bigger and bigger as they go out. And Hubble is in the visual, and Webb will be in the infrared. I'm going to give you an example here of the Crab Nebula. It's seven, six different wavelengths. Same picture, same cosmic item. But this is what we see from Hubble there. This is what we'll see from Webb. We have radio waves. Got that picture, and then you can see X-ray, gamma rays, and ultraviolet. So infrared is our window. We're looking for heat. And space is cold, so we can pick up any heat. Um, web is so sensitive that if a bumblebee were flying around the surface of the moon, web would be able to pick up its heat signature. The moon's a quarter million miles away. That's kind of impressive. So let's go to web and focus on that man. 
Uh, he was the second administrator of NASA. He basically created the Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo programs. He uh, saw way back in 62, John Glenn circled the Earth as the first American orbital astronaut in 1962. And at that point, Mr. Webb was saying, we need a big telescope to be able to see where the heck out there. So, 60 years later, here we go. Uh, we want to be clear, and that's what make sure that Webb is still, Hubble is still a functional telescope. It's still going to give us wonderful images. Uh, it's losing some of its, not scientific capabilities, but its pure ability. And we're able to hold a position a long time. It's getting less and less able to do that. So uh, this is not, Webb is not a replacement. It's simply the next generation. And it used to be called the Next Generation Space Telescope. And Nixchip was not as cool a name as Webb. Right, so uh, NASA saw the benefit of naming it after somebody. So here's the uh, deep field. It took 16 days. Maybe my math was wrong from 200 hours, but uh, it needed four filters to be able to do that. Webb can replicate that in just seven hours. And so if you can do that in seven hours, why not keep it seven days in aim? The list of scientists and experiments they want to do with Webb is already four years filled up. Every second is figured out what Webb is going to be doing because everybody wants a chance to say, my project, my project. So we're going to be learning about a lot of things. So here's the same electromagnetic um, spectrum where Webb falls into place. And redshift is the important thing. When galaxies start out, the light actually is more bluish, and over time, it doesn't lose energy, but it loses its color, its wavelength. And so, I went to great expense and time to demonstrate this. This is my demonstration of wavelengths over time in redshift. And so, as time goes on, the waves bend and they turn more red. And I was going to make more waves, but my arms didn't reach me for it. So <laughs> this is what I get. But this is this is what the red shift is all about, and then what web is all about. Red shift. So 230, depending where the moon is, 240,000 miles away. A quarter million miles wrong in and out. That's how much the universe has expanded just in the 90 minutes that you'll be here. That's just mad boggling to me. So here's what Webb covers. Primarily, the near infrared has three different um, devices, and then one in the middle. In the middle, Webb, oh, I'll get into that in a second here. But remember the MIRI, the mid-infrared, because that needs special cooling to get cold enough. Cold, space is not cold enough. It has to be cold, uh, refrigerated down more just so we can have good detection. So here's the pillars of creation, invisible light on the left, and Hubble with the near-infrared light. And you can see that just the gazillion stars that are here, that you don't see over here. And you see a couple of the big ones here and here. But this is what Webb is going to do to make a difference in how we understand the universe. It's going to just be that way. And then it will get down into the mid-infrared, like the Muri we talked about. Now, this is Spitzer, and it did not have the resolution that Hubble has, or that Webb will have, which is seven times greater. So we're going to get some spectacular pictures from the, the mid-infrared. So here's another, I wanted to make sure that everyone understood this. But here we are looking at the 
normal visual way that if you and I went out to the observatory tonight, darn if we can't, we can see some uh, galaxy. What Webb's going to see is look at all the stars that you don't get to see. The red stars that are smaller, but they make up most of the galaxies. And so, you know, in our galaxy, there are billions and billions and billions of stars. And at the Aerospace Museum, we use an analogy to help understand how many stars there are in the universe. So, you know what a sewing thimble is, the thing you put on your finger? Well, I don't put it on my finger, but when you sew, you put a thimble on it. So it's only this big, smaller than a shot glass, maybe as your thumb, maybe. And if you look out on a clear night, and every star that you saw was a grain of sand, it would fill up a thimble. Okay? If you took all the stars in the Milky Way as grains of sand, you would have a wheelbarrow full. A lot of thimbles in that wheelbarrow. I assume that's a construction wheelbarrow, very big. To give you a grasp of how many stars are in the universe, take a railroad boxcar. You know how gigantic those are, ones that have all graffiti on the side. But if you fill that up with sand, again, each grain of sand representing one star, and you put that in a boxcar, and then you send it by you at one boxcar a second, the number of stars are going to take you three years. So I don't know how many boxcars that is, but it's a lot. There's just stars out there that just keep going. And of course, they're being paraded all the time also. So this is for kids. They get the first choice, and then we'll go to the adults. Do you know the official name of our son? So, man, we have a winner. That guy's smart. I just want to have some pretty pictures from Hubble, just to remind us of how gorgeous our universe is and there's so much to learn. Who knows the official name of our moon? Luna. Luna. Luna, yes. I love this picture. It's just amazing, the dust. So we've talked about the man that's going to the mission. It's basically going to go where no telescope has ever gotten. We're all that from Star Trek, but I thought it was pretty appropriate. It uh, looks like a rocket ship in a way. It has four primary goals. The first is to look back to see almost the Big Bang. We talked about that back to 200 million years. Um, understand how the galaxies actually come together and how they grow and how black holes grow. And one of the biggest black holes that we know about is in the middle of the Milky Way. Luckily, we've got about 24 billion light years before it sucks us in. <laughs> so sleep well tonight, don't worry about it. Um, we want to see stars and protoplanets, and uh, we already have 20 that we have seen through Hubble that we want to explore further with Webb. And then our own solar system, you know, we, we're still trying to see if there is life out there as we know it, or life out there that we don't know. We, Got to figure out a different way to look for it. So we're going to look at each one of those areas now. This red blob is a blow up of a galaxy that was way, 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 way far away. As you can see there. And I like this picture because I thought it was a good depiction of we have no idea what happened. I and mean, that's part of what Webb's going to tell us, what we hope anyway. This is. Uh, a common representation of what the Big Bang theory started out to be, how it started out. The Big Bang, and then there was the Dark Zone, which the Dark Ages was called, and then slowly planets started, or uh, galaxies started being formed, and more galaxies and more and more, and they're expanding, and eventually they'll expand out so that there's nothing, you think. You and I won't be around to figure that out, so we'll just keep moving. Um, this chart shows a little bit about the red wave 
uh, ship. So as we pointed out earlier in the first slide, red is the longest wavelength. After red, you see infrared, which is even longer. And so we want to get more information. And if you look up here at the Big Bang in the yellow, then we go down to its expanding time as you see the universe open up from that little coagulated area to expanding here and expanding even more there. Uh, let's look up here to the one wavelength and look at that little red box. It looks like a tuning fork. That's about one wavelength. And what we're going to do here over time is just go down here and see that the wavelength has expanded. That's the redshift hurry. So it started out blue, it's yellow there, and then where we are today is in the redshift. And so that's the whole uh, uh, call it, the whole driving force of the Webb telescope is all of that. So here's another way to look at that. Again, the Big Bang, the first stars form, but not yet galaxies, and galaxies. Way up at the top, we have our present day. You've got Hubble somewhere a little bit into the near infrared, but Webb comes way down here, and that's the oops, that's the difference that will take us almost to when the first galaxies are formed. Again, 200 million years. Here's what we think we'll find, and these are pictures that have actually been taken by Hubble that are the growth and depth of galaxies over time. And it's just like a cartoon book, you just go from where we are now, here, and it just gets less and less and less until it collapses on itself, and then there's quiet in the universe. And here again is the uh, Famous picture as well, infrared and visible, slightly different perspective, but a lot more stars you can see on the right hand side. Here's the future of the Milky Way. This is, the Milky Way is about 12 billion years old. Remember, time started 13.8, Milky Way is 12. Our galaxy is about four and a half billion years old. So there's where the Milky Way is today. And over time, it will end up just diffusing. Again, that's a timeline we don't have to worry about. Black holes are cool, scary, devastating, exciting. And there's been all sorts of movies made about it, including one called The Event Horizon. And that basically is once you get into that range of the black hole, gravity will suck you in, stretch you out, and you'll never come out. Unless you are Matthew McConaughey in the movie Interstellar. And here's an artist's conception of what the uh, black hole and the jets would look like. Here's one from this particular individual. Here's what Matthew McConaughey got sucked into from uh, Interstellar. How many saw that movie? Yeah, it's one that you, if you haven't seen it, you need to see it. And if you've seen it, you probably need to see it again to understand all the things that were going on. And for decades, no one thought we could take a picture of a black hole because light doesn't come, isn't emitted. It sucks everything in, including light. But somehow, two geniuses uh, put it together, and that's the first actual picture of a black hole. And I can't explain how they got it. I'm just going to show you a picture of what we do have. It's amazing what can be learned through scientific equipment. And so, if you look into a star, you can look at the wavelengths, and the wavelengths of different chemicals are all different. There's no two chemicals that are identical. CO carbon monoxide is different than carbon dioxide. And so here what you have is 
a simulated what water would look like just by looking at that down here at the three microns. Um, methanol, carbon dioxide, ammonia, methane, you can read it all there. And that exists in that star, in that uh, nebula. And it's, we can analyze all of that and well, we'll be able to tone right into that and give us so much more information. Another good picture. So let's see this birth of stars and protoplanets. Um, how many of you know that we've discovered 4,000 protoplanets? Ooh, cool. And you guys get an A, teacher's A today on that one. It's pretty amazing, uh, but it makes sense. And now NASA believes, in the science world, that every star, that wheelbarrow full of stars, has at least one planet. So we've got eight planets, nine if you are Pluto inclusive. <laughs> and so how many opportunities are there for variable variability and opportunity for life? That's the question that we're looking for. This is not from Hubble, but I just saw it yesterday. And it's the first time that this was from the Chilean, Chile, Chilean uh, mountain telescope that's very high. And that's a protoplanetary disk over here. And what you basically have is a Saturn uh, starting to form and a Jupiter starting to form as pairs. And then all around here is lots of dust that will coagulate, it's estimated, into three different moons. Now, how many, who knows how many officially named moons we have for Jupiter? Yeah, you know, well, we're going to see, <laughs> we'll make this one. I said Jupiter, didn't I? Yes. That's the correct answer for Jupiter. The answer for Saturn is? There's over 82 now. There's not even more. 82 officially named, and my uh, NASA specialist over here says that they found a few more. And so we can't call our moon the moon because there are over 200 moons out there in the solar system. They all have names, and that's why we have Luna. We call it the moon because we're not on Jupiter trying to figure out which moon is that today. But uh, that was one of the coolest things I ever saw, which is the same thing that Galileo saw in 1610 when he saw four uh, moons circling Jupiter with his little telescope. Just phenomenal to see the orbital dynamics of all that. So spectroscopy is what is Webb's secret weapon. It takes light and divides it, after it bounces it around, into a spectrum. And every element, just like it has a different chemical composition, also has a different energy composition, therefore it has a different spectrum. And um, this is what spectroscopy can tell us. We can measure gases, we can tell the density of the gases, we know the temperature and the rotation speed, and we also can tell the atmospheric composition, which is what I just showed you a couple slides ago, as well as the minerals on the planet. Pretty amazing capabilities. And here's an example of what the MIRI X, um, instrument can do. That you look down here at wavelengths, and there's a little area here that will spike, goes up, and that's nothing. Here's a spike that happens to be ammonia. And there's a spike that comes in to be acetylene, hydrogen, and carbon dioxide. So by knowing these chemicals, then we can begin to speculate what, how they're put together and what are the components for life as we know them. Here's the 20 uh, protoplanets that I mentioned that we are, I just took, chose these on my own, basically there's a star in the center, and then around there are rings of dust 
that are forming to become moons. And here's one that I think is the most complete. Um, and so Webb is really going to focus on 17 of these 20. And it's one of his primary assignments when it comes under the planetary um, goal. So I think that's pretty cool that we know that those are out there and that we'll be learning a lot more about them. How many of you have heard of the Trappist system? The Trappist system is the most interesting um, planetary system that we have found. Trappist sun is a red dwarf. Red dwarfs are much less powerful and much smaller than the sun, our sun, that is a yellow dwarf. Yellow dwarfs burn out about 10 million years. We're halfway through that, and so we've got another 5 million years to go before it blows up. Um, red stars, as near as they can tell, can last trillions of years uh, because they're, they're not burning themselves up. Yeah, more like a long distance runner than a sprinter. And here, this is the how big our sun would be. And there's the red dwarf. So now we put this, we enlarge it by 25%, and this is the small system, the Trappist system, and then our basically four rocky planets. And you all remember, or many of you remember, the TV show, Third Rock from the Sun. That's what we're referring to. Earth is the third rock from our soul. And you may know that we're looking for the Goldilocks zone. And when you're too close to the sun, it's too hot. And if you're too far away from the sun, it's too cold. So Earth is just right. Mars has a little bit of an atmosphere and a lot of frozen water underground. Uh, Venus used to be a blue marble, just like us, as was Mars. We had three blue marbles three billion years ago. If you're around to check that out, but things change. So here's the Trappist system, and there are three very interesting targets. Uh, planet D is the most Earth-like in its relationship to its star. So we're 93 million miles away with our powerful sun. There's, this is much, much closer, but it's, uh, the red dwarf is much smaller. Also, uh, planet C and planet E, Charlie and Echo, might be in the habitable zone. We don't know that for sure, but um, this is something that Webb will not be able to help us out on, because Webb can't look towards the sun. It would get toasted in a microsecond. <coughs> but this is something that we'll be looking. Uh, this is far out. So, Webb can be looking at Trappist. He can't look at our inner planets because of the sun. Got that clarified? So here's a artist's depiction of Trappist. And NASA's already printing up pictures for travel vacations. If you want to go to Trappist 1E, e, uh, it's been voted the best hot zone vacation by the space writers of America in. 2400. So, you can get your tickets now if you want. This poster, by the way, is available on the NASA website and you can print it out. Um, big poster size. Very, very cool. The Aerospace Museum's got a number of them already posted up there. There's a, probably almost a dozen different posters. If you've got somebody who's a kid or just a space enthusiast, put that up. We'll give that to them as a Christmas present. Pretty cool. Speaking of the Aerospace Museum, this is my uh, two-minute commercial. It is one minute. Uh, how many have not been to the Aerospace Museum? I won't shame you. Okay, that's fine. It is a little-known resource in our supplemental area. And it's undiscovered. People go in and say, I never knew about it. When I go out to groups and I ask, Usually about one or two out of ten will have been there. And that's a shame, because they have all sorts of ever-changing uh, 
displays. This is what it looks like on the outside. I helped raise almost a million dollars to build that $3 million pavilion. Inside we've got airplanes. Outside we have a lot of um, one World War II cargo plane that flew on D-Day and pulled a glider or dropped a pair of troopers. I'm not sure which the role was. Um, lots of there are Korean, there are a couple MiG fighters from the bad guys, back in the day when they were the bad guys. And um, it's an ever changing, so whatever was there last month, it's probably not there this month. Is that the one in McClellan? That's the one in McClellan, yes. And uh, in fact, how many of you saw the Tom Cruise movie <coughs> Oblivion with the bubble machine that he flew around, he was a repairman? Well, that actual prop, the bubble machine, or bubble <laughs> helicopter, is on display on the main floor at the museum. It's an eight million dollar prop. <laughs> and I got to sit in it and uh, flip the switches and was told that the switches were specifically designed for the click that they made. <laughs> so that when the sound went on, the sound had to go <laughs> other than <laughs> So it had a certain sound and they spent quite a bit of money just trying to figure that out. Also, down there at the museum, is the world's largest power-generating kite. It would not fit in this room. It has eight propellers, which are turbines, that when the power is charged, it goes up, flies, and then goes around the loop. It's on a tether, just like a big kite. And then on the way down, the engines store into the batteries and send energy down a cable that's the size of a rusting wire, which maybe you don't all know that size, but size of a rusting wire, and can power 300 homes. And this was a Google um, experimental company, and Google got tired of spending money on it, and uh, they were going to destroy it. And uh, founders of McConaughey, which is the kite, said, hey, uh, uh, Smithsonian, you want this? No. San Diego Aerospace Museum, you want this? No. Hey, McClellan, Aerospace Museum, you want it? Yeah. <laughs> so they brought it out here, paid for the transportation, helped put us up, helped put it up, and it's hanging on the ceiling, just about between where the hang glider is, I don't think that's gone, it's right in here, just beyond, uh, beyond top of this. So. It is impressive to see lots of information on that. So we thank you. This has been your sponsor's message. We'll move on from here. Let's go look at the solar system. And this is where I was hoping there would be a lot more youth involved because I wanted to provide some information. Spectroscopy is what web is all about. And this is an example of using spectrometric analysis of free plants that we know pretty well. When we look at water, Venus doesn't have a lot of water. It's got a lot of carbon dioxide. Earth has a lot of water, we know that. Mars has no visible water. When it comes to ozone, we know that we got a lot. Mars doesn't have but 1% of our atmosphere, so it doesn't have much. And when it comes to carbon dioxide, Mars has 95% of its atmosphere is carbon dioxide. Earth has believe it or not, a very small percentage of carbon dioxide. Um, and Venus has got 96%. Anybody know what the atmospheric pressure is on the surface of Venus? It has a very, very dense atmosphere. I mean, you know, we weigh 160 pounds here on the moon. We weigh 30 pounds, one six of that on Venus, the atmosphere is 90 times heavier than Earth's atmosphere. It would be the equivalent of standing under water a half a mile. Think about the pressure in a 12-foot pool. You go down there and your ears kind of throb. Go down another 3,000 feet, and that's the pressure of 
Venus. And when the Russians first landed there in the 70s, we didn't know how hot it was. It landed and the spacecraft melted. Okay, it didn't totally end up in a puddle, but all the electronics got fried, because we know electronics got to be pretty cool, and it didn't last. We are going to send something to Venus, but it's going to glide around in the clouds at about one atmosphere of pressure and, and sample what's up there. So, very creative what we're doing here. Okay, so, kids, you still have a chance to go home with something. Which planet has the largest volcano? I know, she said Mars. She wins something. Okay, wonderful. So, Olympus Mons is on Mars, the second smallest planet in our solar system, and it has the largest volcano. So there was a lot of tectonic, and there's no volcanic activity now. This one, most of you all in here should know that from eighth grade planetary, right? <laughs> we have a non winner Yeah, Jupiter, the giant of all giant gas giants. And there's uh, Jupiter with Io, sorry, Io. And when Hubble looks at Jupiter, we see it on the left, but what Webb will see are all those different bands. And I don't know if you know, but each of those different colors goes one way, and then the color above it goes the other way, or below it goes the other way. And so it's just literally, not zigzag, but stratified. And uh, Jupiter's about 36,000 miles thick. So if you could stand on the surface and you fell, it would take you a long time to get down to its core. We're not sure what the core is. It could be rocks or it could be molten mercury. So, no, molten hydrogen. So, it just crushes the atoms so close together they have no place to go. Um, oh, I've already given you this answer twice. Galileo. Yeah. And we don't, we only call him by his first name because his heart, his last name sounds too much like his first name. <laughs> and I've already told you this answer that the Earth orbits the Sun, not the other way around. And that's what got him in trouble with the church. Did you know that we have an active volcano on one of the moons? We don't have just one volcano, we have 400 volcanoes that actually spew lava. That's just unbelievable. And that was a picture of that little ball uh, back a few slides ago. So pulled by the gravity of Jupiter that it we have tides, and that's caused by the moon. The actual skin flexes 30 feet a day as it goes around. And so it's just taking that rock and pushing it back and forth, turns it into lava, and therefore there's leaks in the cracks, and then you end up with volcanoes. This is truly the Lord of the Rings. It is Rings are only a couple hundred thousand years old. We don't know where they came from, but we know they're already disappearing. And anybody know how thick they are? Thirty feet. Thirty feet. There's a couple spots that are a mile high that are kind of accumulated snow cones. At Thirty feet, and the distance from there to there, you could put the earth on one side of the rings, earth on one side of the rings, and our moon, Luna, on the other side of the rings, around 240,000 miles wide. Or if you round up, I'm a salesman, you always round up, 250,000. Out of our 200 moons, how many moons have an atmosphere? One. A moon of Saturn that was explored by the uh, spacecraft Cassini that spent 13 years circling um, Saturn and sadly self-destructed into Saturn so that 
NASA has agreed with all other spacefaring countries that we shall leave no potential human bugs anywhere in space. So even though the spacecraft are built in a sanitary weight room and done all the things, there might be a microbe on there and we don't want to take that chance. So we sent Cassini at 77,000 miles an hour into the atmosphere and it just melted and became part of Saturn. But we did launch a probe down to Titan Titan was so thick in this atmosphere, it took two hours for the parachute to go through the atmosphere. It landed and lived about 90 minutes. It landed essentially on a lake shore, and Titan has 40% of its surface covered by a liquid. So, like Earth, Titan has an atmosphere like Earth. Earth has liquid on its surface. We call it water. Titan has liquid on the surface, and we call it propane. Um, and I always joke that if you look, don't want to light a match there, but since there's no oxygen, it's not going to burn anyway. So it's uh, full of hydrocarbons, the stuff that makes initial organisms as we know it. And so um, there is a probe that's called grasshopper. Oh, that's, that's dragonfly. And dragonfly is going to go there, launch in 20, 27, take seven years to get there, it'll land. And uh, how many of you know about the Mars helicopter ingenuity? Okay, I'll start by, yeah, I see, okay, good, cool. Um, Ingenuity weighs four pounds on Earth, a pound and a half on Mars gravity. It's got uh, eight legs. Four, yeah, eight legs. Um, Dragon is going to be, Dragonfly is going to be almost similar to that. But Ingenuity is powered by solar, because Mars is only 140 million miles from Earth and still gets some sun rays. When you are a billion miles away from the sun, you don't get it. So what do we do? We take a helicopter, and we make it nuclear powered. And we make it the size of a pickup that weighs a thousand pounds. Doesn't NASA just think wonderful things and figure out how to do it? It's only going to weigh 137 pounds because Titan's gravity is one seventh of our gravity. So it doesn't have to lift as much just like on Mars, uh, ingenuity doesn't have to live above four pounds. Titan has an atmosphere, we've taken pictures of it, and there's different strata just like we see on our own Earth. Some people have asked about four planets. Pluto got delegated, downgraded to a dwarf planet. We also have other dwarf planets. One of the interesting ones, the very close ones, Ceres, which is in the asteroid belt between <coughs> Mars and Jupiter. So we can get to that much very fast, and we've had probes that have circled that for over a year and found out that it has ice volcanoes. Um, and so more interest will be uh, followed up on all of that. So there's our moon on the upper right and the other four planets. Um, how many saw pictures of Pluto when New Horizons flew by? Well, uh, I've heard answer this. So who, who remembers the answer? Over 200. Hubble has taken these pictures of a two-year hurricane on um, Neptune. It was impressive that we had that capability. Webb is just going to be able to do so much more because we'll be able to temperatures. There's Pluto. It's a slide out of order. Just amazed to find that it was red, that it has ice volcanoes, it has the big heart in the center here. This is one lobe here, and another lobe going this way. Um, who knew? You know, this was found by a 
amateur uh, astronomer in 1938. So um, we just had to send a space probe out there to get close up pictures of it. But what surprised everybody is when the spacecraft went by, turned around, and took a picture. And no one expected this. And this is what we're going to find with the web. Just things that confound us. An atmosphere. There was an atmosphere around Pluto. And this is a picture when the planet blocked the sun. And you can see the atmosphere just like you saw on Titan, or you saw on the Earth. And that's remarkable. We're just going to have so many more remarkable uh, revelations with Webb. 20 years ago, the only place that was on, had water, liquid water in it or on it was Earth. We were sure of that. Everything else is too far away from the sun to have liquid water. I don't guess what. We learned some stuff. So we've got to keep an open mind to science because that's what's ever changing. And there's some pictures of them. Ganymede is with Jupiter, Callisto, Europa, Europa is also with uh, Jupiter, Titan is Saturn, and Triton is with Neptune. So it's way out there, and it still has the water. We know this is called Luna. We know it's very artsy to put the moon into a photograph. Any of you ever been to the backside of Mount Rushmore? You fall by it. Well, then you saw this part. <laughs> There's four other moons in the universe we didn't know about. Okay. And I have to say that everything I say and you hear are uh, my opinion. My, it's not JPL, Laboratory or NASA. So uh, we'll wrap it up here with the machine. Took nine years to design and say, oh, let's redesign it, let's redesign some more. Well, here's some more science we want. Took 11 years to build, and for the last five years, all NASA has done is test and test and retest individual components, and then if they got together and then test those and add those. And um, I don't know if you follow the news, but uh, two weeks ago, one of the clamps that hold it down in the rocket broke. Yikes, probably a $50 clamp. And that would have shook the living daylights out of the web and not made it up. So uh, the price has gone up. Most commonly is $10 billion. Thank you, taxpayers, for agreeing to this along the way. I just saw today someone said $11 billion. Here's the difference in size, seven times more, greater uh, length or collection. Those, each of those panels weighs about 20 pounds. They are beryllium, 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 almost, he, got, he, he says it right, um, covered with gold, a very, very thin amount of gold, about the amount of the weight of a golf ball. Not the size, but the weight of a golf ball. And it's spread out over all of those 22 screens. So it's a pretty thin layer. But it is, gold is one of the, well, it is the best reflector of heat. And so that's what we want the web, is to have the heat. So give you a size idea that Hubble's the size of a school bus, web is the size of a tennis court. You say, okay, well, what's that really mean? Well, put some people in there and you get to see and this has all got to be folded up and put into the top of a space, uh, a rocket that's only 15 feet wide. So, a lot of people went in from a lot of different countries. There will be a test for the kids in the back on these particular uh, producers of different web parts. We talked about the hot and the cold. So, on the, the whole idea of web has got to be cold. It's got to be space cold or colder. And so, it has a giant sail, or an umbrella, if you will, to block it from the sun. Just like oftentimes you see in Japan, people are wearing, carrying umbrellas for the sun. Well, this has five different layers of a, think about mylar, or, or uh, saran wrap, 
Saran wrap is thick compared to these. There's five layers of that. And it pulls it down because the instrument, again, the collecting mirror has to be really cold and it gets down to almost 400, minus 400 degrees Fahrenheit from 185. So 500 degree change in six feet of uh, thickness, pretty impressive. There's what it looks like when the light and heat bounces off. So there's a hot side and there's a cold side of the set. Cold side's on top, the light comes in the mirrors, it bounces to the secondary mirror and then goes into the inside. And I look at that pole and say, oh yeah, it's a typical telescope, you know, eight to 12 inches. Um, no, it's, a man can crawl through it. Uh, or almost crawl through it. That's how big the perspective web is. Here are the uh, mirrors. And the US made all the, th the three primary mirrors, well, the primary, secondary, tertiary, uh, the fine steering mirror, which keeps web aimed at the right uh, place in space, is made by our Canadian friends. And so uh, it's basically a three country, uh, three organization development. NASA's the lead, we got probably 95% of it. Um, the Canadian Space Agency has done this mirror, and the ESA, European Space Agency, has launching the rocket down in uh, South America. I always think that's an impressive picture of a star that has died and has exploded. This is a natural picture also. So the science instruments are four, and uh, we've talked mostly about the near-infrared. That's what we showed you early on about. And now we're going to talk. The MIRI is the uh, mid-infrared. That has to be really cold. These are the capabilities. Um, so you can look at a wide field of stars. We, we now, now that there are truckloads, train loads worth of stars out there, how do you focus on them? The uh, wide field will show you that. We can focus on one single and split its light. We can do even more with the slitted. We can do the multi-object, which I was talking about, and look at putting together galaxies and units. And then we can take a time lapse, which we have not had that capability before. So we can see changes of planets or nebulae or whatever it may be. Here's that same picture. I just wanted to remind you of what spectrum analysis looks like. And I've highlighted each of the instruments that has spectroscopy. That's, you can see every instrument has that capability because NASA's making sure it's got, if one breaks, it's got a replacement. And this diagram I thought was good in that it shows basically the spe only spectroscopy. This has camera spectroscopy and a chronograph, which blocks out the sun so you can see what's going on around it. And then you can see the other capabilities here with cameras, Prospecty, Honograph, etc. So um, those are the instruments. And the cameras have evolved. We know the Civil War, then we got the brownies back in the 50s, Polaroids in the 60s, got to single lens reflex cameras. Now our iPhones are more sophisticated than all of those. And um, it took an iPhone Max Pro and compared it to that's, this is Webb's camera. Eh, you know, iPhone's got four lenses. This looks like it has four lenses. But NASA's got something up its sleeve. Mm -hmm. There's how the frame for it, so you can't put that in your back pocket. Uh, 62,000 lenses, six, yeah, six, no, 62,000 apertures, shutters, if you will, in one square. Mm -hmm. Got four squares to the math, quarter million shutters to take pictures. Wow, you can't, how do you do that? A hundred thousand shutters can be opened all at once. Again, amazing technology, but okay. 
Here, I'm going to give you a close-up of these little shutters. That's tiny, tiny, tiny. And they just magnetically open up and close based on how it's programmed. And this is what it gives you the analysis of uh, whatever uh, object that you're looking at. And I took a long time, and you won't have that time, but these are slightly different, different elements. Um, and that's what the scientists can figure out. What, what are the uh, molecular components to make up whatever we're looking at? Some people refer to Hubble as origami and being folded up. I thought Transformer was more like kids. It's a cool thing. It looks pretty common. And what you got to do is fold it up to fit into a 15-foot wide. And how do you do that when it's as big as a tennis court? Creatively is the answer. And then we're going to launch it from French Guiana. Now, Kate Kennedy's up there. How come we didn't launch it? In Kate Kennedy. The largest rocket ferry to put satellite in or web in was owned by the European Space Agency, the Ariane 5. And so when they started designing web, they said, what's the biggest rocket? Ariane 5, okay, we'll fold it up so it'll fit in that. And that also lets the European Space Agency pay for all of that, and we don't have to. So you can skip me on that. And um, why are we in French Guiana? Or why are the European Space Agency in French Guiana? The equator. And why? Earth spins faster than the equator. So if you launch off, you've got more of a shove. And it's for free. So that means less fuel uh, or less rocket engine power that you need and more fuel capabilities that you can have in the spacecraft. That's also why we're in space at uh, Cape Kennedy. That's about as far south as you can get in the United States to be close to the equator and not be in swampland. Uh, we go down to the Florida Keys, but you know, that's going to be underwater in 15 years, or at least 50 years. So here's the anatomy of the spacecraft when it takes off. Um, little over three minutes, with the spear board, and away from the atmosphere, the uh, little jettison, the shroud. And then for the next month, it will be going out to a place in space, and I'll tell you about that in a second. But the first thing it's got to do is got to get its solar panels out, and then it's got to get its radio on to communicate the antenna, and then we can start giving it directions if it has power to get out to where it needs to go. You can just read those things. I was kind of amazed at 400 pulleys. 1,312 feet just happens to be exactly one quarter of a mile of cable to make that all happen, not to mention 90 cables. So the fear, concern, <laughs> angst is one of those uh, almost a million things have to go right. You know, if one thing doesn't go right, what do we do? Uh, we know that experience with Hubble and its telescope that there's not a problem with this because each of those mirrors has self-adjustment can be done from down here on Earth, so we can line up. We will not have an alignment problem. Our problem is getting all of those pieces to work the way they're supposed to. Uh, and just to reiterate, web circles the sun, while Hubble circles the Earth. So this is going to go around the sun. Here's the answer to your question. It's going to be one million miles, or a million have kilometers to L2. And L2 is a Lagrange point, which is a mathematical point where gravity of different bodies kind of neutralize each other. And so L2 that we're interested in, you want to get away from the sun, you can't stand heat. You want to get away from the Earth because it has a lot of heat. You got to be away from the moon because it has heat. The moon still has a core of 2,200 degrees today. It's cold on the surface, but it's still warm inside. And so we've got to get out a million miles. So we're going to be 
four times the distance of the moon to uh, 900 change million miles to L2. And it's going to park there, and then as the Earth goes around the sun, a uh, web will follow it. Here's a graph that I thought was pretty good to show the difference in gravities. And this is much like a uh, Einstein space-time continuum warp. This is what warps with the gravity and how L2 fits in with all of the Lagrange points. I don't know the math of that. Do you know the math of that? <laughs> we have an expert in, the, in here. We can ask her about Lagrange points afterward tonight. Um, here's the deployment over 100 and some odd days. Starts out, you know, at uh, South America, basically normal temperatures, and then start worrying about temperatures, trying to get things cold as we get into space. Scientists use Kelvin temperatures, not Fahrenheit, not centigrade. Kelvin, zero Kelvin is absolute zero. Um, there is nothing colder, you can't get colder. And water freezes at 273 Kelvin, so, and boils at 300. The MIRI instrument, remember the one that said it was down into the mid-range, has to have an extra cooler to get it down to four degrees Kelvin to be as close to absolute zero as possible as humans can make it. So this is all that's going on for the first 30 days as it cools down. And you can see its progress here is kind of coming down and getting colder and colder and finally it's kicked in where the uh, cryo-cooper kicked up down to seven degrees Kelvin. And I say, my goodness, things we didn't know. And one of the things, um, Hubble has been around 30 years, which is pretty amazing. The space station has been around 20 years. Um, Hubble in the upper right-hand corner would take this picture here. But the Nancy Grace Roman, or the Roman telescope, space telescope, will be 100 times wider, broader, than Hubble. So we're going to see a whole lot more. And she was the first chief of astronomy. And I'm very forward thinking of NASA back in the 60s to have a woman be head of anything, let alone head of astronomy. And uh, she's no longer with us, which is why she gets the name of the telescope named after her. But she's the mother of Hubble. And so, um, where is Webb today? It took a boat ride from Long Beach down through the Panama Canal to uh, French Guiana, and then it got folded in a massive clean room that's bigger than this room. It's clean, you know, microscopically clean, and it took 10 days to fuel it. It's got about 50 pounds of propellant and then another, almost double that, for an extra propellant. It needs some, it's going to get out to the one million mile mark, and then it's got to stop. So it needs propellant to slow it down and stop it. And then it will stay there, and then just have to balance it out, as you saw, as it unfolds. But then every once in a while, when they want to look at that star, then they got to pivot it over. And so uh, what probably will be the limiting factor web is the fuel, it actually will be the coolant for the infrared camera, that that will evaporate. And so we still have capabilities to steer it, but we may not have the mid-range. So web just a few days ago was moved from its final assembly building. It's waiting in another clean room. And one week beforehand, it'll be moved to the general launch area and just two days before it's ready to take off. It'll be put onto the rocket, strapped on with the uh, nose cone, and then run checks on everything else again. There is a website that uh, WST, again, JWST, NASA.gov, you can watch that. There's a live countdown 
counter on that. There's lots of information in those different areas. And have a web, you know, just a web launch party. Just know that you're going to be taking off at 4.20 a.m. So our time. Our time. In the morning, yeah. So things that on your time, or your uh, East Coast time, you know, that's uncomfortable 7 20, but we're going to have to get up in the dark. But I'm going to be up there watching it, so uh, I want to be there live, and everybody will have their fingers crossed, not just for the launch, but for the next month, while all those things try to unfold successfully. And uh, remember, Nine years to design, 11 years to build, and five years to test the thing. And that's all they've been doing is testing. The web is designed for seeing the early universe, learning more about galaxies, having learned about star cycles and other worlds, exoplanets. And we're going to have photos and discoveries in six months that will just astound us and have those questions that we don't even know. Um, I thought this was heartfelt.